My name's uh, Robert Montes, and I'm with the Leadership Institute. And uh, my colleague, Brian Adams, is next for teaching fundraising. Uh, this is going to be the digital media presentations. And I wanted to ask you all, if you don't mind, um, I've got a sign-in sheet here. That I'd like if you can go ahead and put your information down. Uh, reason being, uh, number one, we're happy to share the PowerPoints uh, for the sessions we've been doing. And it's not only the session that you're attending right now, but it's all the sessions we've been doing over the course of the program. Uh, additionally, we also have uh, some, some supplemental material that we prefer not to print out, uh, but we'll send you digital copies as well, uh, relating back to some of the subject matter uh, that we're talking about. So that's one thing. Um, secondly, uh, we are doing a drawing uh, today for $250 worth of LI training, and that may not sound like a lot, but that will cover your attendance in a week-long campaign program up in D.C. Uh, it will cover a majority of the programs we do at, in D.C. Uh, or on the road. The only exception is personalized TV training, which we charge $500 for. But uh, that said, you can attend one of our 43 different programs. Uh, we're going to do the, the drawing a little later today, but in order to be eligible for that opportunity, we do need your contact information. That's our gift to you. Um, why do we want this stuff? Um, real simple reason being that our donors give us money to train people. That's our mission. We're not here to advocate on behalf of the party, activity, uh, individual, anything like that. But our donors give us money to travel. So one of the ways we document that we are out there training and not at Disneyland is we have people sign in, we take some photos, we actually show that we're doing stuff. Um, the last thing that we do with this information is if we do a program in your home location or nearby, we'll let you know about it. Hopefully you enjoyed what you learned today and hopefully you want to go and attend other programs. But that's really the purpose for this. So I'm going to circulate them on uh, either side here. And if you don't mind, just fill that out for just a minute. Uh, like I said, if you've already done this in a previous session, there's no need to do that. Uh, but I appreciate uh, your willingness to do that. Um, so, uh, real, real quick here, I gotta make a confession. Uh, I said this in my earlier session today, um, but this is probably the most difficult program to teach. I, I say that based on my experience working with the Institute, my experience training uh, thousands of programs, tens of thousands of activists. Um, social media is one of those things that is dynamic, it is constantly changing. Uh, with the area of politics and public policy, it is one of the quickest changing areas. What is relevant today won't necessarily be relevant tomorrow. Uh, the tools and techniques that we use are, are important, but this changes all the time. Uh, that said, people's experience levels are vastly different. In this room, they're vastly different. Outside this room, they're vastly different. What you use versus what the person next to you uses may be totally different. What you use it for may be totally different. So in order to help me help you, I want to go around the room here real quick and just have you introduce yourself and explain why you're here today and what you're hoping to get out of the program. Fair enough? Well, sorry, we're here, please. And if you can just stand up and talk to the, the crowd, that'd be terrific. My name is Joe Nichols. I'm a delegate from New Mexico. I'm also running for uh, state rep in District 54 in New Mexico. So I'm going to do these leadership classes to help with that. Great. I'm Jess Nichols. I'm from Mexico as well. I'm here to support him and yeah. All right. Thank you. So we're just doing the introductions. What, what your name is, why you're here. I'm Leonard Schwartz. I'm a candidate for Congress in Michigan's 4th Congressional District. Uh, just here because there's no Democrat on the ballot. All right. We'll just go on this side and go on down. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Linda Comstock uh, from Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I'm here to learn a little bit more about social media and how it's being more effective. And Linda's been to like all our programs we've offered today, I think, right? <laughs> Good for you. Hi, I'm Beth Valentine. Uh, I write for a nonpartisan um, website called allsides.com. Um, and I'm um, going to talk a little bit more about the libertarian law. Beth has also came back from work. Well, that's a punishment, let me tell you. <laughs> that pool's looking really nice right now. <laughs> I'm Susan Prusak, I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm a new member of the party and a delegate, and I'm here to learn as much as I can about where the party can. Thank you. Okay. 
I'm Macy. Uh, I'm here with Adam Kokesh. We're getting ready to uh, run his campaign for 2020, so I'm here to learn as much as I possibly can to help uh, fundraising and with social media, so that's why I'm here. Great. Uh, I'm Larry Kelly, delegate from Oklahoma. Uh, I'm the technology coordinator for the state party here, so I'm here. To... You, you should come out. We're doing it. Where are you at in Oklahoma? Uh, Oklahoma City area, yes. We're doing a campaign academy out there. We're in our third session of five sessions. Uh, you should come out. It's it's uh, Saturday the 11th at uh, Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, I didn't know you guys were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we actually got like a couple guys who were uh, Lutheran Party Texas driving up for it. Okay. So I'll look into it. There's about 20 of them. Yeah, you can join. I'm going for free. Okay. It's fine. Give you lunch too. In the back with your back face to us. <laughs> oh, no. No? Okay. We'll move on. <laughs> Runs up front. Okay. I'm Mark Sen. I'm just a libertarian. I'm just attending the conference. I'm just like an interesting class. Thank you. And I'm Billy Jefferson. I'm his wife. And where he goes, I go. I'm a libertarian as well. My name is uh, James Woodall. I'm a delegate from the state of Arkansas, and I'm very active on social media in my personal life. I'm a musician back in my hometown, so I want to start figuring out other ways to uh, use social media to different advantages. Do you sing? Like to play music? Uh, both. <coughs> okay. Great. Right. My name is Brittany Wolf. I'm from South Carolina. I'm just here to learn and understand more. My name is Chase Wolf. I'm um, his brother. I'm just here to put my Are your parents here too? Or did you guys come by yourself? I'm Mary Zuma. I'm a delegate from Michigan. I'm also running for uh, state representative in the 89th district. And what I want to find out is there's so many platforms out there right now. How to integrate them. You, know, you go from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram to um, whatever is out there. And it can get a little dark. And I want to find out more if I can purchase that. <laughs> All right. Good train to us uh, in the state. We use it, 
And apparently they liked what they saw because he went and petitioned LNC and says, hey, can you guys come out and do some stuff at our national convention? And so we're happy to be here today. This is not the first time I have been to LNC or trained LNC. We've trained their board members years past. We have trained in Texas with LNC, uh, with, with the Texas Libertarian Party. Um, we have gone around to different events and trained uh, numerous libertarian communities, both uh, domestically and internationally. So I'm happy to be with you guys today. Uh, I feel like we are friends, uh, and I, I am looking forward to the session. I think this is going to be some dialogue of things that uh, we can do good, things that we do well, and things we can improve on. Uh, each of you, I will say, are using uh, social media in different capacities, I would assume. Uh, but I don't want to assume fully, because my first session, we asked how many people were you know, on social media, and I have four people who were not. So, show of hands, no judgment here. How many of you are not on social media? All right, very good. And for those of you who are on social media, what are you using? What what platforms? Facebook. How, how do you? How Facebook. 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 It's Twitter. Twitter. Okay. Instagram. Very good. Instagram. Okay. LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what about like Google Chat, any of that kind of stuff? Any of the Google communities? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The Google Hangouts? Okay. What are you guys using? Facebook and Twitter. Is Facebook and Twitter? Not, not uh, Snapchat? No. <laughs> 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 All right. I have yet to have anyone admit to using Tinder either, so. <laughs> but, uh, well, it, it, I, I'm taking this from the perspective that, you know, what is the majority of people out there using, all right? Uh, first off, you have to, if you're involved in politics, if you're an, an office holder and you are uh, someone in part of an organization, you have to have a website, okay? I'm just gonna say that is the baseline right there. Uh, if you do not have a website, uh, you're missing a key component to your digital strategy, all right? You can create a website these days pretty cheaply. Uh, you can get it up and running, but you, what digital media, social media will not do is it will not allow you to dive very deep. And a lot of times as libertarians, we like to get caught into the weeds. We like to dive really deep into the issues, right? Brevity is not necessarily one of our strong points, okay? That is a challenge and that's direct opposition to what happens on social media. Social media is quick, it's punchy, it's to the point. Policy stuff is long and lengthy and descript, as it should be. But that is the stuff that should be housed on a website, okay? Does everyone understand that? So you have to have a website, you can easily create a website. You know, it's, it's cost effective nowadays. Um, but that's something you need to have as a baseline of your organization. If you are just an activist, all right, you can get away with Facebook, you can get away with Twitter, uh, but my recommendation to you is this. If you are transitioning from being a individual to trying to be an office holder, you need to create separate profiles, okay? This is important because not all worlds should live in the same, uh, not, not, not all, all people should live in the same world. All right? You will have people who are your friends who don't agree with you politically, right? Hopefully. Hopefully you, you're diverse enough. All right? You do not want people putting up disparaging remarks on your campaign page or making smart-ass comments on your campaign page. So you need to have two separate things. The other thing is, too, the degree that you monitor and, and what you do with those pages will differ as your campaign and as your organization goes along. So, two different silos, people can belong to both, but the two will never meet, all right? Really important to understand. Um, secondly, why, what are we gonna talk about today? Well, I think that some of the most important things to talk about are what, you know, 80% of the people out there, 90% of the people out there are using. Facebook and Twitter, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to populate those, we're gonna talk about videos, some memes, things like that. How do you make this more engaging, more interactive, where you can channel people back to your website, where you can draw new audiences? But I think that's extremely important 
you know, it, it, it would be foolish for me to go out and talk about something that only 10% of the people were using. Right? It's about numbers when it comes to social media. Okay? That's, that's really important. Um, and it's about increasing our effectiveness on social media using those numbers. So we're going to give some just best practices, best case examples. Uh, you see there, you've got Foursquare, and Foursquare is basically dead. You have Facebook, you got Twitter, you got Flickr, you got Tumblr, you got all this stuff, right? There's all this clutter. And the excuses I get from a lot of people that I said they're not on social media, they say it's overwhelming. I heard that excuse four different times today. It's overwhelming, I don't have the time, okay? The first thing I'm gonna to say to you is it doesn't have to be overwhelming. If you are dabbling with social media in the slightest, you will find that a lot of times you can link your accounts so that when you do your, you populate things, you only have to populate it once and it blasts out. The second thing is social media is not the answer. It will never be the answer. Either you are a good communicator or you're not. Social media is a medium. That's it. That is it. Okay? You have to be an effective communicator and you have to learn how to own those skills. Now, social media, you're dealing with an attention span of about negative uh, one second. Okay? That's the reality. People don't pay attention on social media like they would you and I in conversation. So you have to be punchy, you have to be quick, you have to get to the point. You have to have good headlines. You have to have teasers. All right? The approach is different. The approach is different. But you still have to learn how to communicate effectively. Um, one of the things that, that, that I've seen, too, is social media is different experiences for different people. How you absorb information and how you disseminate information may be completely different from the person next to you. All right, when I first started using Twitter, one of the things I just did is I read and I read and I read articles. Like, all I did was just, uh, or, or tweets. I just looked at it and I just consumed. And I didn't put anything out there. And then I decided, because I was a little shy about uh, letting the world know my political views, one of the things I'm passionate about is travel. So I got involved with some of the travel blogs. I had to spend a lot of time on a plane, I decided I'd follow some of the people out there that write travel blogs do stuff like that. And then I started kind of following people and tweeting at them and things like that. And that was kind of me dipping my toes in the water with some of this stuff. Um, I am still very much of the mindset that I'm careful what I put out there politically. This is my lifestyle. Uh, this is also my wages. And I don't think I necessarily need to put out every opinion that comes into my head. Nor do I think everyone wants to listen to that. Okay, so you have to have a little bit of uh, discretion, what you're putting out there, with the understanding that it does live forever as well. Right, opinions change. You're seeing this right now, I think it's, it's interesting. I mean, we're at the Libertarian uh, National Convention you're going to be deciding your nominee, you're going to be deciding your officers, you're going to be deciding a lot of stuff. And it might be contentious over the weekend. It's been a little contentious going in, right? Um, the reality is the stuff that is said right now, you can say it to somebody's face and you can say, oh, I'm sorry, forgive me. But once it goes online, it is there forever. And if you're one of those people that it's hard for you to you know, make amends or you're stubborn or whatever, that's something that comes back and haunts you for a long time. And so you have to look at what you're putting out there. And be very, 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 very careful. Um, I want to talk to you about strategy for just a second. So I said you, you have to be a good communicator. Well, social media is one of those, those things that you look at and you say, all right, it won the race for Barack Obama. It's winning races for this person and that person. And on the surface, it, like, it, you look at it and you say, wow, this is, this is the magic silver bullet, right? But it's not. It is not, it is not. If you look at this, what you have in this diagram right here is first circle, second circle, third circle. This came out of Obama's legacy report. And they looked back and they said, what are the things that we did well? What are the things we can improve on? One of the things he got a lot of credit for was how he utilize social media and the amount of money and energy that they invested in social media. 
it got to the point where if we start with this first circle, all right, this is all our contacts, okay? So this would be us in the room right here, right? These are our friends around us. If we expanded it to the second circle, these are our friends outside of the room. These are our friends that are at the convention, okay? The third circle represented everyone else that wasn't here and at the convention. Obama did such a good job in their targeting of social media that 95% of the people online fell into either the first or the second circle. 95% of the people online were reached by a friend of a friend, either a friend or a friend of a friend. That's a powerful, powerful statement. And I'll tell you why it's so powerful. So we've got one, two, three, four millennials, maybe, I'm not gonna get into ages, maybe you guys are millennials. Sorry, I don't think you're a millennial, but I'm not gonna pass any judgments. So, so millennials, the interesting thing about them is there's been studies that have been shown that millennials are much more receptive to ideas when it comes from somebody in their peer network. Okay, this could be online, this could be people they go to school with, this could be friends, neighbors, but it's somebody on their, on their level. And the biggest way to tap into that that they found out was through social media. The biggest way. So when they sat there and they looked at this and they said, we can reach out to 95% of the population out there for the millennial demographic, that's powerful. That's extremely, extremely powerful. Millennials, uh, if you don't believe me, you can go to Pew Foundation. They did a whole study on millennials, a bunch of studies actually. And, and millennials, you know what their highest distrust was? Politicians. Politicians. So their vector into politicians was friends of friends. This is why Bernie's like going crazy right now, right? Some of the stuff he's doing. Uh, 95% of the online users out there were reached in those first few circles. Took a lot of money, took a lot of strategy. Um, I'm gonna talk about the ladder of engagement in a little bit, but the ladder of engagement basically says that when you bring people in, and a lot of times it is through digital media, social media, emails, newsletters, that is the first step to them progressively taking harder and harder action. Okay, so what does harder and harder actions look like politically? Well, this is somebody going out there and deciding that they're going to make phone calls. Somebody going out there knocking doors. Those people going out and recruiting their friends and family to knock doors. Those people opening their wallets to help candidates. Those people turning out and working on campaigns, right? But the majority of these people, according to the lack of engagement, all filter in or most, the majority filter in through social media in very small baby steps. Does this make sense? So this is why this stuff matters. That's Obama's Facebook page, um, recent screenshot. Uh, you know, it's got 37 million likes here, right? At the time I, I took this, 37 million likes. Uh, that might be up, it might be down, I don't know. But one of the, the interesting things is we place this prominence on the likes, right? How many friends, how many followers, how many, you know, that's just a number, guys. And any organization, any candidate can pay for that. If you spend enough money, you can always bump your metrics up. That doesn't mean that these people are engaged. We're talking about activism. We're talking about people going out and doing stuff, right? Helping the cause. So it's not just the numbers. Do not be disappointed if you look at your Facebook number and be like, oh, I only have 20 people that like me. All right, it's what are, what are they doing? Are they having a conversation about you? Are they going out and working? Are, they, are you doing stuff to generate content? And are they talking about you? That the engagement is very, very important. This was, uh, I don't know why this projector is so bad. But this was just a, uh, Facebook puts out best practices all the time. And this was just kind of how do you start a, a Facebook fan, uh, group page. Uh, you know, very, very basic stuff, but for some people that are just starting out and they don't know the difference, you know, this is helpful. Facebook puts out best practices. And, and I would encourage you, if you're not real familiar with Facebook uh, or groups, 
you know, some of the stuff that they talk about, you'll see, is really important. Posts between 100 to 250 characters uh, get about 60% more likes, and more comments, and shares. This is what I was saying going back to brevity, right? So if I decide that I'm going to post something really long, it only takes me a short amount of time to make that one initial post, right? But if I chop that up into 10 pieces, potentially it could take me a lot longer to post, right? I have to be more dedicated, I have to figure out timing, things like that. And a lot of people say, well, I don't want to do that. Like, I, I can't, I don't have the time. I only get an hour a day to do this kind of stuff. You can schedule your posts. And I highly recommend you do schedule your posts. You don't have to be as active as it appears. Any of you have an email and you send like an email out in the middle of the night to make your boss think you're working really hard, really, but it's like you're only 4 p.m., right? You can schedule these things in advance. Uh, the same as it works in email, it works with Facebook, it works with Twitter. You can load a bunch of stuff up there and just decide when it comes out and when it releases. That's an important element because it is the consistency of your content that a lot of people judge. Have you ever been to a website and the website hasn't been updated in like six months? Do you go back to that website? If you look at and there's Facebook, I, I get you know friend requests and uh, Twitter requests all the time, and I meet a lot of people every every week, between 60 to 100 people on average based on what I do, and I don't get a chance to remember names very well. So when I get these invites, I go and I look, and one of the first things I look at is when did they last tweet? Right? Is this a dummy account? Is it a fake account? Is it what, was their Facebook hijacked? And I just happened to get something, which I get a lot. But I look at when was their last correspondence? When was their last update to determine if this is somebody that I'm going to allow me to follow or vice versa, or I'm going to communicate to? So consistency when you communicate is really, really important. Uh, the length of the post. The other thing, and I, I don't, I hadn't seen this enough today, guys, I'm not gonna be honest with you. Um, people pulling out their phones and taking pictures. I think that's an important thing because we're visual beings. About 70% of what we do today is based on what we see. What we learn is based on what we see. And so when you're taking pictures, why is this good? Well, if you're here at a national convention to learn how to become more effective activists and help the candidates of your choice, that's pretty exciting, I think. I think it's inspiring, I think it's motivating. Why would you not want to share that with the people who are not allowed to be here? If you're out there and you're a candidate in your district and you're working hard, right, don't you want people to know that, that you're out there trying to learn about the issues and be more effective communicators, right? You're committed to excellence by being here. You should let people know that. You have to be your best self-promoter. And so taking pictures of the experience this weekend, things you're learning, things you like, what you've done, share that stuff. The other thing is people pay more attention to it. Photos and videos, you got the numbers right there. Photos and videos get 180, 120, and 100% more engagement, respectively. I don't want to read a bunch of words if I can look at a picture. I like videos. Videos are fun. Videos are entertaining. Take videos. Take, take this stuff. Um, so again, Facebook puts this stuff out there. Uh, they, thank you for taking a video in the back. <laughs> uh, so Facebook puts best practices out there, and they want to see you be successful. Believe it or not, they, you know, they want to encourage you guys to generate more likes and more followers and things like that, right? Because it helps with their ad revenue. The more successful you are, the more happy Facebook is. Um, little secret, I told the, the group earlier today, so my wife works in the commerce, uh, uh, she works in the commerce committee in the Senate, and uh, you know, Facebook's had a little issue the last couple weeks. Uh, there's been some issues about questioning how fair they are, uh, how neutral they are when it comes to trending topics, things like that. And uh, my wife, by virtue of her position there, was in charge of like the whole program. Uh, with Facebook coming in and talking about things. And, uh, the irony of the whole thing is she does not have a Facebook account. She's not on social media. <laughs> she says well, for what she does, she doesn't want any like information to be out there on her ever. But Facebook came in, they're very concerned.
and they said, we want to make sure that conservatives are getting their message out, that we are a neutral platform for discussion and debate. And they admitted that they weren't necessarily fit, even though in spite of their best efforts, that wasn't always the case. So I think that you're gonna see Facebook pay a lot more attention to issues. I think particularly at a national political party convention, you start posting stuff this week, you'd be surprised how much coverage you could get. I really encourage you to take a lot of photos, take videos, post stuff. And the other side of it is too, you know, copy influential people who have wide distribution bands to be able to share your network and share your information. So this case study with advocacy organizations and what they, they looked at, this is not just me, but what they looked at is, is it calls to action. So how many of you have ever seen, hey, please like this, right? Somebody says, please like this, right? Well, if you, somebody, just by virtue of them saying, please like this, they get about 100% more engagement. 100%, that can be substantial. Uh, somebody saying share, about 68%. But if somebody decides to ask for comments, give me your thoughts, what are you thinking? 192%, 192% more engagement. That is substantial, guys. Um, my millennial friends, one of the things that I've seen, and please tell me if I'm incorrect, but Millennials, more than any other demographic out there, like to feel that their opinion is wanted and valued and appreciated and asked for. Am I correct? And so a simple thing like, you know, please give me your opinion, you would be surprised how much more engagement you get. Am I correct? You know, just it's simple. And by them commenting and by them linking to by tweet or whatever, I have now tapped into their network, which is important, but it also allowed them to become closer and feel closer to me and my organization and my mission. So I really, really encourage you, suggest comments, suggest feedback. Not only because it opens new doors, but the other thing is too, you might really get some valuable, valuable like feedback that you can use. And you might be off base on something, and they might help correct you, put you more on base. Uh, the other thing, again, is uh, word count. So they talked about there being a sweet spot on this. And uh, you know, you definitely, they, they say post links should be shorter. Uh, 40 characters is a, is a good sweet spot. Anything more than that is, is too much. Uh, this is a shifting, shifting topic. I will say that you know Twitter talked about 140 characters, right? And, uh, like I, what I have seen is the more our attention span goes down, the shorter the posts become. All right, and the more pithy and witty you have to become in your titles. Um, err on the side of less is more in general. All right, you will tell you will tell how much of an impact you have when you can see how much when people are reading and responding, but less is generally more on the stuff. Um, this is this is Barack Obama's Twitter page. Um, you know, they, I am not a fan of Brock's, but one of the things I thought that they did very well was when it came to their social media engagement, they hired people who were apolitical. All right, and they said we just want the best of the best to help us. We want the people who can do social media engineering to come on board, and they hired out Silicon Valley, and they hired you know, and that story's been told right a lot, but. They said, we don't care if you're political, because we'll convert you over eventually. We just want the best of the best. And that is also a pretty smart idea, right? And they did convert a bunch of them over. Um, but at the end of the day, they realized that, you know, in order to reach a broader audience, talent matters. Uh, this was, you know, something interesting during the Windy Days stuff down in Texas, you know, the big debate over there. Um, this was a tweet that Brock put out. Uh, he tagged OFA on it, uh, and they started the hashtag stand with Wendy, right? With Wendy Davis with the, uh, the issue of abortion. And so they got, that, they got that whole thing going. And create the hashtags, you'll be amazed how much more publicity you can get with a creative hashtag, right? I think people overdo hashtags a lot, 
I think that, you know, they think it's just a, it's a great thing and hashtag everything. No, I think one creative hashtag is, is very helpful. And I assume everyone knows what a hashtag is here. If they don't, sort of. I mean, ha hashtag is basically like, well, file folder, if you will. You, you create a hashtag and everything under that particular issue can fall under the hashtag. So in this case, they were talking about Wendy Davis, and anytime anyone would put anything out about Wendy Davis, they'd do the hashtag Wendy Davis, I'd stand with, with Wendy, and everything would filter in. And it was just a sorting mechanism, because there's a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. So it just helps find tweets and, and, and it also help people understand what was trending. Um, so Twitter interaction, I, I always thought this was interesting. Uh, Twitter has its own language, right? And one of the things that they talked about was uh, asking people to do stuff. In politics, you consistently have to ask people to do stuff. Whether it's asking for votes, asking for money, asking to share stuff, asking to come to an event. But if you've never asked anybody to do anything on Twitter, um, about 10% of the population out there would actually retweet your content or share your content. Uh, if, you add, if you said, please RT, which Again, in Twitter, space is valuable, so people would do, would do shortcuts. Please RT, please retweet. About, yet what, 40% of the people would, would actually share it? If you put out there, please retweet, you bumped another 10% to 50% just by spelling please retweet. Why is this? I think that uh, for us, in, in our ideology and more around with our demographics. Um, the fastest growing demographics are people that are uh, 45 to uh, 70 with their online social media, okay? Fastest growing demographic, and I think that there's a little bit of catch up to do. And so the more we spell things out for them, the more people became a little more comfortable understanding what was being asked. Does this make sense? So, you know, if you tell people what you want, make it easy, then they do it. So that, that was Twitter. Um, you know, how many of you have smartphones? Who in here not have a smartphone? I'm gonna get you up to speed, my friend. <laughs> but you know, smartphones are so valuable for a variety of reasons. Uh, they are a visual recording of everything we do. You can take pictures, so you can communicate. But the other nice thing is that you can quickly monitor what's going on in real time with your social media. And TweetDeck and Hootsuite are just a couple examples of uh, being able to monitor a lot of issues at once fairly easily. They both have mobile applications. You can get them on tablets too. And what you will find uh, very quickly with Twitter and, and, and stuff like, there's so much content that if you're ADD, I would suggest not even going on. All right, it will become overwhelming, and before you know it, like 30 minutes has turned into three hours. All right, but that said, if you're able to be disciplined, if you're able to commit, I'm going to check this and, and work on this from this time to this time, uh, something like TweetDeck and Hootsuite can be really valuable to you because you can see everything that's happening at once. So plug your own name in there. If people are talking about you, it shows up in one of the columns. If people are talking about your opposition, it shows up in one of the columns. If people are talking about you know, the Libertarian Party and LNC and the convention, it shows up in another column. But you can self-select the information that comes into it, which is extremely, extremely valuable. I, I would, as an activist, want to know what my fellow conventioneers are saying this weekend, what they're talking about. So I am sure there's a hashtag that LNC has going right now. I, I, I would be looking at that. I would add it. Um, the other thing that people are, are doing, and this was probably the best example I saw put forth, um, Human Rights Campaign uh, did the marriage equality sign. You guys recognize this? Um, I don't care what you think about the particular issue. The, the relevance of this, to me, was they took something very simple like a, a, an image, and they decided that we're gonna simplify the issue equals, right? Equals means that for for the people of the political ideology and that, that marriage is the same, same. And so they went to the human rights campaign, went to Facebook, and they decided that they were gonna, you know, create this logo and they were gonna share it out. And they went to Twitter and they created the logo and shared it with everyone. And what you had, 
really quickly, and I'm sure the numbers have bumped since this, but 2.7 million Facebook users updated the profile picture. Think about that, 2.7 million people. What's the average uh, person having their friends on Facebook? I mean, hundreds of people? It might be you know, a thousand people, I don't know the numbers. But if 2.7 million users with a thousand friends each did this, do you understand the reach of that? Twitter, same thing. Like, you know, 71,000 shares. Uh, and then you had celebrities who have hundreds of millions of followers, right? I mean, Justin Bieber is like 160 million followers. Anything he does is automatic news, good or bad. But they did something like this, and all of a sudden it was reach, and it was scope, and it was breadth, and that was all that anyone was talking about. And so, 2.7 million people on my, was it Facebook has how many millions? Or might be a billion people. But they have all these users, and 2.7 on the aggregate, it's not that many. But it was the reach. Really, really important. Um, building a list. So this is a this is an online. Uh, example of a petition drive. All right. Now you can use this. You can integrate it with your website. You can integrate it with Twitter. You can integrate it with Facebook. But ideally, you are growing your network and contact list. And this was an example of an advocacy issue that came up about gun rights. Uh, this was after one of the, the uh, mass shootings, unfortunately. So uh, they came up with this, and what it was was, hey, you know, uh, let's. Let's call our representatives to help stop gun violence. You plugged in your email, uh, you plugged in your zip code, and then you hit enter. And you can link this back to your social media as well. All right, why was this important? Because it's not just enough to have Facebook followers and Twitter followers. You actually have to activate those people to do something. You have to activate them to do something. And so what they did is they used stuff like this to have people call into Congress, to have people write letters, to have online petition drives uh, dropped off. They also augmented it with some other methods too. Personal contacts, clipboards, old canvassing, traditional online, uh, offline methods, websites, petitions, online advertising. You know, oh, by the way, word of caution, Facebook advertising, um, I think Facebook advertising is good in the sense that you can do some message development and you can help understand what people are paying attention to. But when we do events, and we did some stuff with like Facebook before publicizing our events, it's amazing how many people would like something, would commit to coming, and never show up. Okay? Facebook events are not a reliable source of bringing people into rooms. Please understand that. And they can be expensive too. But you know, you have your online advertising, list journals, exchanges. These are all ways to develop your list with the idea that you'll activate these uh, at some point. This was another example that uh, Mike Lee and Ted Cruz put together when it was funding for Obamacare on the Republican side. This kind of stuff costs money, guys. I'm not, I'm not telling you it's cheap, but you have to build a mass group of people in order to, to build a movement, right? And as great as Gary Johnson is, and as great as McAfee is, and, and some of these other folks, and they have their followings, what are you running for? And how do you build up your following, right? You have to find ways to, to build up your own lists. So they took issues, they took issue campaigns, and they put that out there to build their lists. Uh, they then went into to emails, because that was one of the biggest things you can capture is emails. Uh, and then they looked at some of the email providers, okay? Once you start to get to the point where you're over a thousand emails and you're regularly communicating with these folks, which this is that next step on the lateral engagement, uh, you have to go to a mail provider. You really do. Mail providers are 15, 20, 30, 30 bucks a month. But what they do is they protect the integrity of your email lists, which is really important. How many times do we get spammed all the time, right? Like, okay, and then you get enough of it, you tune people out. These guys protect your list to make sure that they're being used effectively um, and you're not being spammed. 
They also tell you when people are opening your emails, because that's important. If you're sending your emails out and nobody's paying attention to them, it doesn't matter, right? If you're getting higher uh, open rates because you've changed the wording in a subject line, that matters. That tells you something. So they give you some real important metrics here. Uh, and then ideally, whether it's your Facebook page, your Twitter page, your email list, your online websites, you come to a point where you have to mobilize that list. You do have to bring bodies to events. There has to be a show of force. And this is what happened uh, in Wisconsin with the teachers union. So they were, you know, they were protesting Scott Walker and some of the stuff he was doing. They tried to recall. They were doing all this stuff. And eventually they said, okay, now we're going to show up at the Capitol. And this picture went around the world. This was pictures of educators going out and protesting Walker and what he was doing. Powerful, powerful image. You know, there's this whole term out there, hacktivist, and you know, people are like, oh, they're just online, just you know, writing blog posts and liking things, and like, but they're not real people. That's real people, guys. That says a lot. This is what you want when it comes to your issues, when it comes to your party, and when it comes to your candidates. You need real bodies to show up. So that's that ladder of engagement that I talked about earlier. You attract them. Social media provides your, your opening hook to attract them. You convert them over. Um, ideally, you keep them informed and engaged. So where's that, that sign-in sheet at? I don't know everyone's filling it out right now, right? Uh, that sign-in sheet allows us to contact you. We do webinars. We do webinars about every two weeks, talking about best practices, things like that. We do those free of charge. So if somebody would go to a webinar that we put out, they like what they saw, they decide, hey, you know what, I'm gonna go to another session of LI. I'm gonna make a trip up to DC to go to LI. I'm gonna become a donor to LI. I'm gonna tell my friends and family to become donors to LI. Oh, and I'm gonna leave them in their, in a, or, and leave LI in our will. Like that's a progression as an organization, right? Progression for a candidate might be different. I'm gonna sign up to their email list. I'm gonna come and volunteer. I'm gonna you know, come and knock doors. I'm gonna bring my friends and my family to knock doors. Uh, I'm gonna become a donor. But you need that ladder of engagement, okay? There, people should not stay the same. I should not be on somebody's email list after five years and that's all I do. You don't want that, that's not healthy. Uh, specific calls to action. Uh, share an article on Facebook. So one of, the, one of the big things that we haven't talked about, but I think it's really important, is you can't just promote yourself in social media. Because it's transparent, it doesn't look good, and the reality is you have to be team players in politics. So when you find good and interesting stuff, put it out there. Put it out there for consumption. Hey, I found this interesting article, what do you think about it? Hey, you know, I'm conducting an online poll about this. What do you think? Put stuff out there. It's about not only sharing your content, but it's about sharing your friends and family, neighbors, and, uh, and allies' content on Facebook, Twitter. Uh, write a letter to your public official. Hey, I just contacted such and such about this issue. Uh, wanted to let you guys see a snapshot of the letter I wrote. Um, call your public official. Write a letter. Attend a political event. These are all options that things you can share on Facebook and on social media. National Rifle Association, this is one of the things that they put out, these email action alerts, and they, they consistently put this stuff out, right? It's like, hey, this is what we're doing, this is how we're engaged. It is a reminder to their activists, it is a shot in the arm, it is a reminder to their donors, hey, we are doing stuff. We are not a dead organization. Uh, blog posts, same thing. Contact your senators. You'll notice here one of the things they did, make it real easy. Here's the phone number. They, they spoon fed the people to take action. Um, social media updates, you will see that between Twitter and Facebook, it is the same thing. Same post, right? That goes back to what I was saying about how you can replicate everything. You know, you only have to do things right one time. If you decided to put a long post on Facebook, you could never use that for Twitter. If you decided to put a bunch of garlic on Twitter, when it came on Facebook, it wouldn't look right. So 
So you have to understand how things work a little bit and how it kind of crosses over, but um, you can easily do that. This is an example of Brock with another, another uh, online petition they did. And you see that zip code down there. Zip codes are important. Zip codes let us geo-target. If I know I have a lot of activists and you know, 22153 zip code, guess what that tells me? You know what, I might want to do an event, a physical event in that zip code because I'm going to have a lot of people turn out. If I want to geo-target a particular message, I have a lot of people in there. That tells me that's a good, good sample for my organization. So zip codes the email matter. Um, I'll wrap this up real quickly, but do legislators actually pay attention to digital lobbying efforts? I worked on Capitol Hill, my wife currently works on Capitol Hill. They are bombarded with stuff all the time, and a lot of times we feel like they don't listen to us, right? Um, probably one of the greatest examples I saw of that, you guys familiar with SOPA and HIPAA, right? This was kind of one of those things, the internet freedom. And, um, they looked at this stuff, and what they did is a lot of the websites out there decided they were going to do a coordinated blackout. Um, 75,000 websites participated in the protest, including Google. Major, major websites were concerned about internet security, uh, internet access, and that caught the attention of a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people didn't know what SOPA and PIPA were, so they went to Wikipedia. 162 million people went to Wikipedia and looked it up. Out of that, 8 million people looked for their congressman list. 4.5 million signed Google's petition. And at the end of the day, this is a big deal. Look at the amount of senators and bipartisan senators who backed down from the legislation. This is a coordinated online effort. Hugely, hugely impactful. You're seeing this right now in, in Target. You've seen the, black, uh, the, the boycott of Target right now? Do you know how much that's costing in their stock value? $10 billion. $10 billion because of their bathroom decision and boycott. And, and you go to like, you look online and it's everywhere. Whether you agree, disagree with the issue, that's a real impact to a major company. People pay attention to this stuff, guys. Um, as Saul Alinsky said, power is not only what you have, but what the enemy thinks you have. A handful of well-armed uh, militia can do amazing things, right? If you, are, if you are aware of how to use social media, you can be extremely, extremely powerful. So um, I know this was probably not everything everyone wanted, and you have your own individual questions and stuff, so I'd be happy to answer questions for a few minutes. Or not. <laughs> I have never heard that. Um, okay. That that there runs. Was a comment that somebody made in the class. Yeah, that runs contrary to what I do uh, personally. Thought depends mm -hmm. on what you're posting. Uh, yeah. If you have a campaign account and you're doing that back and forth between Twitter, that's fine. Okay. But if it's your personal and you're like sending pictures of cats, yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. To Twitter, oh, yeah, yeah. Two different it. spheres, like yeah. political over here, yeah. Facebook, Twitter, personal over here. Two don't mean. Any other thoughts? Yeah. What about Periscope? I've been hearing about that and other things like it recently. How would I sure. uh, maximize? Does everyone here know what Periscope is? So Periscope is like a live streaming uh, of events and you can download the app on your phone and you can go and you can take video of whatever it is you're doing. So it's kind of this cool thing that um, people are, are using and actually my wife's boss, Senator Fiona, was the first senator to ever use Periscope in a meeting. Like they came in and what they did is they just kind of videotaped the meeting and people in real time can respond and they can ask questions and, and it's this kind of really neat interactive tool. Um, so people periscope everything. You could be periscoping me training right now and it will go live and it'll be recorded and, and then you have the option of saving that and replaying it later. You have the option of deleting it. Um, but it's, just, it's kind of a, a fun little snapshot to be able to see what's going on at any point in time. It's video, it's interactive, it's like the best of both worlds uh, online in real time. 
So I, I like Periscope. I personally do not use Periscope. Uh, it's a, a method for me. I, I watch Periscope. I like you can sign up, you can follow people, you can do all that kind of stuff. Um, I just don't do it as part of my social activism. Uh, and part of it is because I'm usually training, and so it's awkward to hold the camera. <laughs> but yeah. Does this par parallel the uh, go live option that Facebook is doing now? Is it like that? I have not seen that, so that's new to me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it, it, quite possibly. Yeah, I mean. Would there be privacy issues? Potentially. I mean, there, there always is, right? Anything you do, social media. Like, yeah. You know, it just depends. It's like. Every time I take a picture, we, we add technically on our signage, we have a camera that we can use a person's image, right? Um, people want to make an issue out of it, but there's, I think reasonably when you're in a public setting, there is no right to privacy. That's the definition as I understand it by the attorneys, including my wife. <laughs> so. All right, well, I think we're about wrapped up here, so thank you guys very much. If you haven't signed in on the sign-in sheet, please do. Uh, we'll be notifying the, the winner of the drawing a little later today, and uh, appreciate your time. Thank you.